This is Come to the Table, Bible studies from the New Testament Christian Church of Cheyenne. These studies are presented every Tuesday night at 7 p.m. at our church at 3800 East Pershing Boulevard in Cheyenne, Wyoming. If you'd like to contribute to these studies, you can make a donation at www.myntcc.org backslash Cheyenne WY dash giving. Matthew chapter four, and we're still in kind of our flashback um, because we wanted to, I wanted to backtrack us and pick up the very beginnings of Jesus's teachings from the book of Matthew or from the gospel according to Matthew. And so last week we dug into we dug into the three temptations that Jesus faced right after he was baptized by John the Baptist, came up out of the water, the Spirit of God descended and, and began to dwell within him. And then, as we talked about last week, he was led of the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. And we talked mostly, I believe we talked mostly about the very first temptation because of Jesus' answer and the lessons that we learned in not only his answer, but in the setting and how Jesus faced off against the adversary. And I feel compelled uh, to share this with us, to share this with everyone here tonight. The devil is real. Now, don't misunderstand my wanting to share this, okay? We're not trying to give him any glory or any undue credit. We're not even trying to give him credit. We're really just trying to give him blame. And it's not even about blame so much as it is reminding, warning, advising all of us because the Scriptures advise us and warn us that the devil is real. The devil is a liar. The devil is a predator among predators. And he is, as the Bible tells us and warns us, the devil is as a roaring lion, he wanders about and he's always seeking whom he may devour. And so knowing that we have an enemy, knowing that the enemy is real and knowing this about his character, OK, that he's not a silly looking cartoon character in red tights with a silly tail and a pitchfork. That is not the devil. That is either Renaissance or pre-Renaissance imagery that was concocted centuries ago, has its roots in some pagan origins. The devil transforms himself. The Bible says this, that the devil transforms himself into an angel of light. Why? Because he is a liar that he may deceive those who are God's elect, those that are God's people, those that have repented of their sins, accepted Christ, and are now called by God's name. He transforms himself into an angel of light, just like politicians do all the time. I'm sorry, was that too blunt? <laughs> you know, but people make their own reputations. They really do. And so it's no different. So we have lesson upon lesson upon lesson in this chapter, just in Jesus's own in the temptation of Christ that he that that Christ faced out in the wilderness. And so we talked about how. He was led of the Spirit out there. That's what happens when we are filled with the Spirit, is that we should allow ourselves to be led by the Spirit. We must allow ourselves to be led by the Spirit. And then out there in the wilderness, he fasted 40 days, 40 nights. He was hungry. We speculated as to some of the reason why it was 40 days. Not want to try to get too dogmatic on things that the Scripture isn't absolutely clear on, but... We know that by the end of that 40 days, any kind of physical resistance and stubbornness or anything that might have been there that might have aided him. Don't misunderstand me what I mean by the word stubbornness. Um, anything that might have aided him in the natural sense to face off against the enemy would have been completely depleted by those 40 days. So when he faced off against the devil, he didn't just face up and the devil didn't just like show up. You know, again, like a guy in red tights with a pitchfork. Hi, I'm the devil here to tempt you. He's not that obvious. He's not that obvious. He seldom comes barging through the front door in our lives. He's a master of sneaking in the back door. And it's always, I love it. I don't, I don't remember who first described it as this. I don't remember if it was an old time preacher or, or, or somebody that just had a keen insight. I think it was the former. He said words to this effect that the devil, when he comes in, and I don't mean comes like possessing someone, I mean when he comes around somebody's life to mess with them, okay? He comes in through doors that are intentionally left unlocked. 
You know what we mean by that? When we not walking circumspect as Christians and as believers, when we not walking uh, mindful of how to guard our own hearts, all right? And we're not being cautious and we're not being wise. And we make, as the Bible describes it, we make provision for the flesh, which the Bible tells us not to do. It says, make not provision for the flesh. Why? Because the apostles and the prophets and all of them, they all understood that the flesh is weak. And as we talked about in the afternoon Bible study today at Whispering Chase, the flesh is the dumb dog that will chase every rabbit if it's allowed to. And so it's on us to yank that leash back by the Spirit, by the soul, and by the leading of the Spirit of God. So all of this is just preamble. I want to get into what we're talking about. So Jesus faced the devil, and he faced the devil by the Spirit of God and standing on the Word of God. And we really leaned heavy on that last week, and I, I want to remind us of that as so we bear that in mind for tonight's study. Jesus said in the first temptation, when the devil said, if you're the Son of God, command these stones be made bread. Jesus said, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone. And what's really cool about that is Jesus, know what, Jesus knew what the devil meant. Jesus knew that the devil was talking about turning stones into literal bread so he could feed his body. And Jesus snatched that right out of the devil's hands and turned the tables on the whole context of the confrontation and turned it into something spiritual instead of focusing on the physical. He said, man shall not live by bread alone. Jesus answered him in the spiritual, quoting the word of God. The second temptation, all right, verse six, verse five, excuse me. Then the devil taketh him up into the holy city, which would have been Jerusalem, and setteth him on a pinnacle of the temple, and saith unto him, If thou be the Son of God, cast thyself down, for it is written, He shall give his angels charge concerning thee, and in their hands they shall bear thee up, lest at any time thou dash thy foot against the stone. And Jesus said unto him, It is written again, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. So it's not a, a perfect repeat of the first uh, temptation because in the second temptation, the devil steps up his game and he starts quoting scripture. Oh, okay, we're, we're going to do it like this, Jesus. Okay, well, I know scripture too because trust me, the devil knows scripture because that's his kind of his job. He's a master of lies and he's a master tempter. And again, I'm not trying to heap any glory on him, okay? This is condemning. These are indictments against him. He is a master at tempting people. He knows where their weak spots are. He is old in the extreme. He knows Bible better than most, if not all, people. We have to remember who he was in the beginning of things. He wasn't always the devil. He wasn't always the devil. He was once Lucifer, the light bearer. That's what the name means. Lucifer means bearer of light. God created him as an angel. Traditionally, it's understood that he was God's most beautiful angel or something like that. His anointed or covering cherub or something along those lines. He was in a rather exalted place in the heavenly hierarchy of things, in the angelic hierarchy. And there's a lot more could be said about that, but don't want to make the whole lesson tonight on the origins of the devil. But it was through his own pride. He fell in love with himself. He was the original narcissist and the original intellectual who fell in love with his own intellect, his own beauty, his own all these other things. And some of that's conjectured by theologians in, in, in ages gone by, but it fits a certain pattern. And what happens whenever a man or a woman falls so in love and is so enchanted with their own understanding of things and with uh, their own take on things and their own theory on things, is what happens is they get lifted up in pride. That's Romans chapter 1. That's the human race in the, in the generations before the flood that wiped everyone but Noah and his family out. What happens is professing themselves and thinking themselves to be wise, they became fools. Why do they become fools? Because they believe themselves to be completely self-sufficient. There are believers that fall into that trap. Did you know that? And you usually find them in places like, well, not in places like, but um, 
in terms of stages of life, right? You usually find them uh, stuck firmly at home because they know too much to be a part of any church. The self-sufficient Christian has fallen into a very similar trap that the devil has fallen into. And I know we've rabbit trailed a little bit. We'll get back onto our text here in just a second. But that's important to remember. Jesus established His church for a reason. Not so that believers could think that they were sufficient in and of themselves. Because when you get to thinking that you're sufficient in and of yourself, then you no longer believe that you need the divine. You no longer believe that you need the leading of the Holy Ghost, the instruction or the the teaching of people that God has ordained and appointed and put in place for the edification and the perfection of the saints, etc., etc., etc. And all of this is just New Testament stuff we're talking about now. This isn't even conjecture. This is right out of the Bible. And so self-sufficiency in some areas is wonderful, but in the spiritual life, in the Christian life, in our walk with God, we can't ever become completely self-deficient. Self-efficient, excuse me. We have to be. We have to remain completely reliant upon God. We have to be. Because when we stop being that way, then we turn into somebody like this. Lucifer. Proud, unteachable, unmanageable, unguidable, uneverythingable. And people like that, you know, they're so confident in their... Well, I have a THD. That's a legitimate suffix, I guess, or a title. You can actually get that. It's a doctor of theology as opposed to doctor of philosophy, which I think is what PhD means. I'm a little rusty on that too. I might have that wrong. But you know, I have this exalted eight-year degree in my particular theological education and training, and don't you know I know more than the average pastor? Well, good. What are you doing with it? There's the question. I'm not against education. I went to a Bible college. Thumbs up. It's good to be educated. But we can't become so proud in that that we're no longer teachable by the Word and by the Spirit. We can't, we can't, we can't. So all of that branching from the second temptation. The devil steps up his game and starts quoting Scripture himself. He reaches back into the Old Testament and brings up some prophecy from the book of Isaiah here in verse 6. He said, if thou be the son of God, cast thyself down, for it is written, he shall give his angels charge concerning thee. And that's true. It is written that God would give his angels charge and responsibility concerning the Messiah, the son of God, Jesus, that and in their hands they shall bear thee up, lest at any time thou thou dash thy foot against a stone. But Jesus, again, wasn't playing into the devil's trap. He says, is it... Jesus said unto him, it is written again, thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. And the layers here are also, the lessons here are also layered, okay? Because there's the answer that he gives and then there's the lessons that we can extract from that. The devil knows the Bible. We have to know the Bible better. So how in the world can we ever know the Bible better than the devil? Simple, we have the Holy Ghost. He doesn't. And so we have understanding. We have understanding that he doesn't possess. He has information. We have the spirit. The information is nothing but data. It's not like he's living according to the word of God. Okay, he's just doing what he's doing. We, if we have the spirit of God dwelling in us, so well, I'm a Christian and don't have the spirit of God dwelling in me. Why not? You need the Spirit of God dwelling in you. That's something that if you're not 100% certain that you have and that it is manifested in your life, you really, brother, sister, whoever you may be, you really need to hit your knees tonight and start seeking the indwelling of the Holy Ghost. You really do. And that's not me trying to beat a drum until I break it. That's not me trying to be specifically Pentecostal in the message. That is power and comfort and we absolutely have to have that. Jesus had to have that before he faced this trial. He knew the word already. We know that because he confounded the doctors of the law back in the temple when he was 12 years old. But he still needed the indwelling of the Holy Spirit in his life. If he needed it, How much more do we? The experience, I mean, the Spirit is a person. We don't call Him it. But you you understand what we're saying. So Jesus said, it is written again, 
thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. Well, where's another lesson that we pull out of this is that while the devil was technically right in what he was quoting, he was presenting it in a way that Jesus would have been wrong to act upon. And the way I try to describe this is that there's a difference between tempting the Lord your God and stepping out on faith and relying on the Lord your God. Do you understand what we're saying there? It's a difference in motives. It's a difference in spirit, okay? The one who tempts the Lord is acting out of a spirit of, I don't really believe or I'm not entirely convinced that whatever it is that I'm reading in the scriptures at this particular place is really what it says or that God is really going to keep his word or that this promise or that this prophecy or whatever is true. That's the kind of spirit behind tempting the Lord. That's a person who's kind of stepping out to prove God wrong because they're already convinced in their own mind, oh, well, God's not going to do it. God's not going to do that. It's an unbelieving heart that tempts the Lord. A lot of times, if not all. But the person that is depending on God, well, now that's a whole different motive, isn't it? That's a whole different motive. That's the person that God has spoken to them and has spoken to their heart and has said, uh, do this or stop doing this and don't worry, I've got the results covered or something like that. God has spoken to them or revealed something to them in His Word. We read a promise from God in the Bible and it speaks to us and we're like, that's for me. I'm going to believe that and I'm going to actually live according to that. That's a person who is not tempting God. And you know what? There's, a, there's an example of this. And I want to be careful how I express this because people get awfully touchy whenever you bring up the subject of money, okay? Especially in the church. The devil has trained people to completely trigger and freak out whenever the subject of money comes out in the church and then automatically jump to the wrong conclusion that, oh, well, the preacher's just after my money. Money, 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 money. No, 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 no. Okay, now the Bible talks about something called tithe and talks about something called offerings. Those are two different things. Not turning this into a lesson on tithe tonight. Only using this as an example on what we're talking about and the point that we're making here. When a person, especially someone who's new in the faith, comes across something in the Bible that talks about what they should contribute to the work, okay? Because that even predates the law of Moses, so it's not from the law of Moses. It existed long before, over 700 years. We find examples of tithe uh, earlier. But they, they come across that, and the first thing that the devil says to someone like that is, or to a new believer on that subject, the first thing the devil says is, you can't afford it. You can't do that because you can't afford it. Don't you know you got bills? Don't you know you got this? You got that. You got to get groceries on the table. Your baby needs a new pair of shoes. And you don't even have a baby, you know, but the devil tells somebody that anyway, because why not? You know, anything to trip up the believer. But when the believer, recognizing the voice of the devil as being the, being the subtle silvery whisper that it is, and there's actually some Hebrew behind that, uh, behind that particular description of him, the, the believer, not being ignorant of the devil's devices and recognizing the devil's slithery little voice and saying in their own hearts, saying, you know what? I'm going to do it. And God's going to make a way. That's a person that's stepping out on faith. They're stepping out on faith and they're trusting God to be able to make it possible for them to do now, that's only one example of a multitude of examples that could be used. Jesus was calling this out on the devil. It, and he wasn't calling it out from the positive. He was telling the devil that he wasn't, he wasn't going to fall for the devil trying to take Scripture and twist it and contort it to get him to do something that wasn't right. And so right here in verse 7, Jesus gives his answer. It is written again, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. Period. End of story. For Jesus to have jumped off the pinnacle of the temple as though to test those scriptures would have been a wrong motive for him to do. He wouldn't have been in accordance with the right spirit. Well, then why was that prophecy there? One might ask this question. Why was that prophecy there back in Isaiah uh, that, he, that he quotes here in verse 6 of Matthew chapter 4? Why was it there then? Well, have you ever had an accident? 
Have you ever been in a car crash? Have you ever fallen off a loading dock? I did that once. I was working in a warehouse with another brother and I was, we were moving something heavy and I was the guy walking backwards and I didn't even see the dock behind me. And I stepped right off that thing like a complete idiot. And I fell, only fell about three feet. Boom, hit the pavement. I felt, I felt, uh, or excuse me, let me rephrase this. I was more embarrassed than I was hurt. There you go. Because it kicks your pride when you do something silly like that. And then the first thing you do when you get up off the ground and you're cleaning the moss off your clothes, because hello, Washington, moss grows on roofs up there, is if you stand up and you look around and you hope nobody saw you do that. Like when you tried to push the door that said pull. Or vice versa. That prophecy was there to make it clear that the Son of God, the Messiah... The, the Savior of the world, the promised one of Israel, was not going to be subject to accidents because God had given His own angels charge concerning His safety, lest at any time He should dash His foot against a stone. It's not to say that He was immune to pain, okay? But kind of hard to fulfill a messianic prophecy about none of your bones being broken because that ties into how animal sacrifices in the Old Testament had to be. Had to be. Kind of hard to fulfill that prophecy if at the age of nine, you're out running around and you fall off, you fall off of something and break your arm. Right? So the whole purpose of that was the prophecy was real, but the devil misused it. Jesus saw through it and shut it down and said, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. It is written, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. So, and then the surface level, the actual answer that Jesus gives here is important to remember too, because sometimes we get to thinking, sometimes we can get to thinking maybe in a wrong direction. You say, well, or you read something in the Bible, or you do like that one guy said we heard about years ago, who uh, he was one of those believers that believed that God just told him things all the time, right? Oh, God told me this, God told me that, God God told me to run through that wall. Well, that was something that he actually thought God told him to do in a church service. And so he ran full speed headfirst at a wall in the church during a service. And after he picked himself up off the floor, because he bounced his melon clean off that thing like a basketball, he I, I don't know if he said it before he got up or after he got up, he said, God told me, don't you ever do that again. Just because we think sometimes that God's telling us to do something doesn't mean that it's actually the voice of the Lord. We have to learn to hear His voice. There's a difference. We, we need to know the voice of our shepherd. We need to know the voice of our Father in heaven. We need to know when it's Him or if it's something that's just our own imagination or if it's even the enemy himself. The prophecy was there to assure, to assure Israel and believers, of course, in retrospect, but to assure Israel that Messiah wasn't going to be killed prematurely by an accident. God had that covered. Let's move on to the next temptation. Verse 8. Again, the devil taketh him up into an exceeding high mountain and showeth him all the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them and saith unto him, all these things will I give thee if thou wilt fall down and worship me. Ooh. This is the boldest of all the temptations right here. So the devil takes him up into an exceeding high mountain. We don't know which mountain it was. Maybe it was Everest. Maybe it was something more regional, more local. We don't know. It could have been anywhere. The devil takes him up to a very high mountain. He shows him all the kingdoms of the world. And he, shows, and he shows Jesus the glory of the kingdoms of the world. And he says unto him, All these will I give to thee. I will give thee if thou wilt fall down and worship me. You want to talk about guts. The devil himself speaking to the Son of God. God, the Son of God. And telling him, If you just worship me, I'll give you all these kingdoms. And now here's the thing, and I, and I want to jump back to last week when we, we focused on the key word about this whole, this whole part of this chapter, the temptations of Christ, okay? The key word was, in fact, tempted, right? We brought that out last week. It says it right here in, in verse 1. 
Then was Jesus led up of the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. These weren't nothing offers to the Lord. These weren't just easy challenges that were given to him. Okay? Let me, let me think of something outrageous and over the top so that I'm, I'm not actually pegging anyone between the eyes, okay? Um, I, don't know what, I, don't, I don't know if anybody in here has been liberated from, uh, from illegal drugs, illicit drugs, or anything like that, okay? But let's, just, let's talk about heroin, all right? If you've never done heroin, and you've never experienced what it does to you, okay, or does to a person, to their brain, what it lights up and how, then it isn't a temptation, is it? If it's not something that has any appeal to you, that's actually where I need to approach it from. If it's not something that's had any, that has any kind of appeal to you at all, then it isn't a temptation. Somebody could come up to you with it, you know, with the, whatever the paraphernalia is that's involved in heroin. I think they cook it in a spoon or something like that. If you got to cook something in a spoon, what in the world makes you think that it's good to take into your system? Yeah. But if someone came up to you with that, with the lighter or the bong or the joint or the roach clip or whatever it was for whatever drug it was and said, hey, don't you want some of this? You're like, no, because it's not a temptation to you. Jesus was, in fact, tempted by these three things here in chapter 4. We're not saying that to shine some kind of a bad light on Jesus. But you have to remember... He was tempted. And that means, not that there was anything wrong with him, that means that he knows what it's like. And because he knows what it's like, he identifies with us. And he is able to have a degree of compassion that otherwise perhaps he could not. He has an understanding. Because the Bible even tells us that he, being made in the likeness of sinful flesh, was not sinful, he knew no sin, but he was made in the likeness of sinful flesh, and he was tempted in every point as we are. So he knows what it's like to face a temptation for something that he could want, but knows it would be wrong to take or to have. Let's look at this last temptation again, okay, with this reminder in, our, in, our, in the forefront of our minds. He takes him to an exceeding high mountain. He shows him all the kingdoms of the world and he shows him their glory. And he says, I'll give all these kingdoms to you, Jesus. I will give you lordship and rulership over all of these kingdoms. And that was no empty temptation because in those days, the devil had those kingdoms. He had not yet been cast out. He had been cast out of heaven. Yes, that was from time immemorial. But he had not yet had that authority taken away from him by Jesus' own death yet. The devil had those kingdoms. He could have made good on that promise. And I will venture to speculate, okay? So don't take this as dogmatic fact. But I would venture to speculate since verse 1 tells us that it was temptation, okay? I would venture to speculate that the thought actually crossed Jesus' mind. If I had all these kingdoms, I could fix every one of their problems. I could show them the right way to live. I could bring them into the path of light. Don't think that that thought didn't cross Jesus' mind. Now, maybe it did not. But then how would it have been a temptation? So, careful, preacher. You're talking about my Jesus. I know he's my Jesus too. He's my Jesus too. I'm not attributing any sin to him because to be tempted is not a sin. It is not a sin to be tempted. It becomes a sin when we give in. Eve didn't sin until she took that fruit and partook of it. She could have been tempted all the live long day because it was a nice fruit. It was desirous, you know, to eat, to, good to eat, and all the other things that were supposed to come with it that the devil trumped up while minimizing the penalty because that's what the devil does. He's a liar and he mixes lies with truth to make them more believable. That's what he does. So yes, Jesus was tempted. But what counts is that he did not give in. As we read verse 10, this is what Jesus said to the devil. Then saith Jesus unto him, Get thee hence. In other words, 
I'm done listening to you, devil. Get away from me. Get thee hence, Satan, for it is written. He relies on the word of God again. For it is written, thou shalt worship the Lord thy God and him only shalt thou serve. Done. End of story. He depended upon the word, not upon his own or human reasoning. Not that we're saying that his reasoning was merely human, but Jesus was every bit human. Just as much as he was every bit God. You've got to be careful when you navigate these waters because there are different church traditions that have got into bitter, vicious, schismatic debates upon was Jesus man or was Jesus God or was Jesus both? Well, Jesus was both. We understand that from the word. He was completely divine, but he lived in a human body. And the human body still has its needs, okay? So, let's go back to verse 10. Jesus saith unto him, Get thee hence, Satan. For it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and Him only shalt thou serve. Now, that, was a, that was a serious bullet that he had dodged. Because can you imagine what would have happened if he had given in to that? God, the Son of God, committing idolatry in worshiping the devil himself. That actually threatens to warp my mind a little bit when I think about how... Uh, how how devastating that could have been. But you see, it wasn't in Jesus' nature to actually do such a thing, was it? So then you could ask yourself the question, was there, even any, was there even any real danger that he would have? You know what? I don't know. I don't know. I don't think so. But the Bible does tell us that he was tempted. And because he was tempted, he understands when we are. But we have his model here, don't we? And that's the big, that's probably just as much uh, of the takeaway and the lesson from this whole part of chapter four as anything else. Jesus is our model. And how he did it is how we should do it. He relied on the word, being led and being filled with the spirit, right? He relied upon the word of God because it never changes. And in the fog of war and in the conflict of temptation and, 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 and in the confusion that can arise in the midst of being presented with something you want, but it wouldn't be right to have. OK, you can stand on the word because the word is clear and it never changes. And that's a bedrock, man. That is a tremendous blessing and, and a wonderful thing to count on in the midst of what we face. That the word never changes and it cuts through all the confusion. And so that's what Jesus relied on when he gave the devil his answers. The devil said, do this. And Jesus said, no, it's written. So there's lesson number one. Well, lesson number two or three, if you count being led by the spirit and being filled with the spirit is lessons one or one and two. He relied on the word. And then he did according to the word. He did not do what the devil said to do. Brothers and sisters, that's our example. That's the way we want to be. And whenever we're faced with anything by the devil, whether it's the devil or one of his low budget minions, as I've heard him described, and I like to call him that too. Because sometimes, sometimes, and we'll wrap up here in just a moment. Sometimes, have you ever caught yourself thinking, some kind of thought that was just so completely whacked out and crazy that you knew that it didn't come from you. You knew it had to come from, you know, one of the agents of the enemy, so to speak. I'm being kind by calling them that. For example, and, and I'll use a third party example. A good friend of mine, a, a minister in one of our churches elsewhere, was telling a story. He'd been clean. He'd been free from cigarettes even for years and years and uh, hadn't... Uh, Hadn't succumbed to any of that in a long time. And one day he was out either in a car or in a restaurant or somebody and somebody else's secondhand smoke comes wafting across his nostrils. And then this ridiculous thought comes into his mind. Wouldn't you love a cigarette right now? It'd been like 10 years or something like that since he'd had one. And the thought itself was so absurd that he knew it wasn't from his own mind. He knew that it was from, as I think he himself put it, one of the devil's low budget minions or low budget devils or something like that. And I think he even laughed it off and just walked away completely untempted, unmoved, unfazed and unfallen. 
Have you ever had a thought like that? Has the devil ever tried to run something like that, that past your mind? Brings up some old song from your past or sends some old flame across your path from high school or something that absurd. And I'm getting to the age now where it's like, they're all old too. <laughs> Sorry, I get a kick out of that. But we have Jesus' example how to do it and ultimately to simply not give in. So if you find yourself tempted, okay, don't think you've sinned just because you've been tempted. If it's a temptation to do something that's wrong, that's intrinsically wrong, then what you do is this. You remember your Bible, which, if you haven't read, be reading so that you can do what Jesus did. Jesus quoted Scripture because He knew Scripture. Remember your Bible and answer the devil in the same fashion. Don't do it in pride. Don't do it in self-reliance. But you do it in the simple, confident knowledge of the Word of God. No, devil, it is written, thou shalt not, or it is written, flee fornication. That's a big one for, that's, that's a big one for Christians right there. It really is, because the devil knows that that's a weak point in a lot of people's lives, especially in a society that's as oversexed as this one, okay? But you remember your Bible that pertains to that temptation, and you said, no, for it is written. Say it out loud if you, ha if you can, if you must, because the spoken word has power. It really does. It helps nail it down and cement it, cement your resolve in reality. It really does. Say it out loud. Quote your scripture. Stand your ground. And when he tries to bring up other scripture to justify it, you remember the very first one that you brought up. Remember the very first scripture that you brought up to not fall into that or to not give in to that temptation. And then what you do is, like James talked about over in the book of James, resist the devil and he will flee. And you do what he said to do right before that. Submit yourself to God. So you remember your Bible, throw it in the devil's face, and then you go find a place to pray. You, break, you take it to God. You say, God, I was tempted. And if it was something that was wrong to do because it was inherently wrong, God, I don't ever want to be tempted with that again. Help me. I don't even want that desire in my heart. Because if the desire is even gone from your heart, the devil can't ever tempt you with it again. Because it's a nothing thing, right? I don't know if that was good English, but I think the meaning was clear. So... From the temptations of Christ, we have a battle plan for how to enter or for how to, how to engage, well, he engages us, for how to handle the devil's attacks. The Word, the Spirit, and take it to God in prayer. Thank you for listening to Come to the Table, Bible studies from the New Testament Christian Church of Cheyenne. Included in these presentations are red-letter studies on the life and teachings of our Lord Jesus Christ, historical studies on the Old Testament, topical studies on biblical doctrines, and practical studies on Christian life. If you enjoyed this presentation, you can support our efforts by contributing at www.myntcc.org backslash giving